Dear Father in heaven, we are once again thankful to uh, be gathered together in opening your word, and we invite your spirit uh, to be here. We ask, Lord, that uh, the convicting power of your spirit will be here. We know, Lord, that we are going over very simple things, but these simple things are foundational uh, to this message, and we need to understand these things. So we ask that you can enlighten our minds um, and that we can obey your voice. Be with each one here, with all the needs that we have, all the worries and concerns, and uh, may you comfort us in spite of uh, the situation that we see around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the second part, uh, second part of my series of three lectures, which uh, you'll find in the notes that you have. And the notes are a little bit easier to read than listening to me speak, mm -hmm. uh, because they're very organized, well thought out, and that doesn't always happen when I'm talking. But there is a benefit for me talking, uh, because it, it's, once you've heard me talk, it'll be easier to read my notes. Now, we did cover the first four trumpets, and we really are following the pioneer's understanding of the trumpets. And we could see that the trumpets are not to be in the future, and we're not supposed to uh, try to make the first four trumpets periods of time. Uh, there's so many different errors that have creeped in. And many people who are trying to defend Josiah Litch's date, when you go on the internet and you read about them, you read what they say about the trumpets, they get a lot of the things wrong regarding the trumpets. They think they're defending the trumpets, but it's just that they've heard so many different versions of the trumpets uh, that they don't really know what the truth is. And, and I was in that boat to a large degree. Uh, didn't fully understand all of the trumpets. I, you know, I would always focus on the woes, but I knew that when I read uh, Revelation 8 and 9, I couldn't really uh, presented in a way that was convincing. And we need to be able to understand that, not just for ourselves, but for others. And as I said earlier in my first talk, it sets down the principles of prophetic interpretation. So when we go through the trumpets, if we're following the correct principles, the trumpets are a good demonstration on how to interpret the Bible, how to interpret Miller's rules. And when you follow Miller's rules, you'll come to the same conclusions as Miller, except that we will see things that Miller couldn't have seen because of the time in which he was living in, uh, and also with the new light that is coming from God's Word, as we examine these old truths, there is an unfolding. We see things that we never saw before. Now, the eighth chapter ends with the proclamation Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets and of the three angels which are yet to sound. And so these are three woes that are going to be proclaimed. And we saw that the first four trumpets were judgments against pagan Rome. And uh, the next two trumpets are judgments against papal Rome. So the fifth and sixth trumpets are judgments against papal Rome, and the seventh trumpet is judgments against modern Rome. Uh, and so that's really the structure in which the trumpets are. And you know they're they're grouped as four and three, and the three is actually uh, two and one. And I'm not going to go into that, but this pattern shows up again and again in the scriptures. You mean the three and the four. Yeah, the four and the three. Yeah. Uh, so that's an important pattern you know, to understand. Now, one of the questions is, why are these final trumpets woes compared to the first four trumpets? One of the things about it is, when we look at the fall of pagan Rome, who, who caused the fall of pagan Rome? 
Well, pagan Rome, but who, who, who brought judgments against pagan Rome? <coughs> The barbarian tribes. And what happened to those tribes? They became the ten nations of Europe. Right. And they became, to a large extent, Christian nations. The Protestant Reformation came from those nations. But when we're looking at the, the woes, the woes is dealing with a different type of power that is bringing judgments against Papal Rome and modern Rome. And uh, this power, when we look at it, we see it's a satanic power which is Islam, right? And I know there's some people who don't like to hear that. You hear a lot of this, you know, Allah is just God, right? And Islam has a lot of truth and so forth. I studied Islam. Islam is a satanic religion. It is nothing in it that is any light, okay? And so this power is a satanic power. Now God uses this power to just like he uses lots of powers that are evil to bring judgments and against uh, apostate uh, nations and churches. So let's read here in Revelation 9, uh, starting in verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Now, we understand this star. What star fell from heaven? Lucifer fell from heaven. So some people look at this and they say, well, this is Lucifer. But this is just using satanic imagery to apply to Islam. So right? Yeah, a satanic entity. Right. So Islam is satanic, and so satanic imagery is used. And so this refers to Muhammad, so he falls in the manner of Satan. And to him was given a key of the bottomless pit. So what is the bottomless pit in the Bible? So, I mean, we could do an intensive study on this, but we know it's the earth, right? After, during the thousand years, right? And uh, Satan is going to be bound to that, to this earth. But here, in this case, it is, does represent the earth, but it doesn't represent the whole earth. It, it represents Arabia, because that's where Muhammad arose. And he opened the bottomless pit, as opposed to closing it, as in Revelation 20, verse 1. So, Satan is sealed up, but this pit is opened, right? And there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of the great furnace, which uh, can be used in the Bible symbol symbolizing affliction, and also false teaching. So, I, you know, again, I'm not going through and showing you all these things, but you can do word studies on these verses and find this symbolism in the Bible. And the sun in the air. So the sun represents what? It represents lots of things in the Bible. But it does represent the truth. In the past, it represented the gospel. Right. So, so here it is. The sun in the air is the gospel. Right? And they were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. So we're taking these as the Muslim hordes. Right? And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And we're going to see what that means. And it was commanded unto them by Abu Bakr, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God, the, of God in their foreheads. So we're going to look at the command of Abu Bakr. But one of the things that we see is... Uh, they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. And we're going to see that in Abu Bakr's command. Um, but also these represent, even though there's judgments, there's a restraint put upon this power uh, during this time period. Um, but they still do some damage, obviously, or they wouldn't be bringing a judgment. And to, to them it was given that they should not kill them, so, and their authority. So, the authority or the power of uh, Rome during this period, it's not ended by Islam at this time, right, in the fifth trumpet. Um, and that they should be tormented five months. So, here is brought a period, five months, there's 30 days in a month. So, five months, 150 days. And in a day for a year prophecy, that's 150 years. And we're going to look at these timelines. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall man seek death and shall not find it. 
and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, right? So we can see that, are these literal? They're symbols. Now, they, sometimes symbols can also have a literal component in that if you look on the 1843 and the 1850 charts, you can see they're riding horses. But the idea is the symbol of the horse representing Islam. The symbol of the locust representing Islam. So sometimes there can be you know, something that, that appears literal, but the symbol is the most important aspect to identify something. Okay. Um, so these locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns, which is turbans like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, they had beards, and they had hair as the hair of women, Arabians did not cut their hair, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, which refers to a persecution, the ability to persecute. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and so this is a reference to the milita military nature of Islam, right? So this is, and we look at this, we can see that this is definitely a military conflict, and we'll see that more. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. So Islam, of course, are noted for their use of horses, and they use very few footmen. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, as I read. And they had... Uh, and they had tails like unto scorpions. Now, the prophet that telleth lies, he is the tail, right? So we can see that this is dealing with their false teachings uh, that of Muhammad. So that's what one of the things that we can look at as these stings of the scorpions. And the stings were in their tails, teachings of war. So one of the things that uh, Muhammad taught really was, oh, I need to go down to the next one. There we go. Uh, they're teaching of, of war. So one of the main things that Muhammad taught was the idea of presenting uh, the Islamic gospel, if you want to call it that, by war, right? Jihad, okay? And, uh, and the, their power was to hurt men five months. Once again, five months is man th mentioned here, which is 150 years. And they had a king over them, which we understand to be Othman, which was the angel of the bottomless pit, which of course is a reference to Satan, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, destroyer. Both of those mean destroyer. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So there are the verses. Now, as I said, we can see that this is a military imagery that's being used in the woes. And so people who try to, you know, take these things and apply them to the plagues, the plagues are different than the woes, right? They're similar. We saw that there were similarities, and there's differences. And the similarity exists because the trumpets are um, judgments against uh, pagan Rome and papal Rome, where the plagues are judgments against modern Rome, right, at the end of the world. So they have similarities. They both are plagues, but the, the trumpets here have a historic fulfillment. The plagues are still future, okay? Now, one of the things it talks about is that these armies of Iv Islam are like the locust hordes that come in, like locusts. And locusts last five months, uh, the desert locusts, from May to September. And we're going to look at that in a bit more t detail as well. And Islam also fits this time period after the fall of pagan Rome is when Islam, at the, and the beginning of papal Rome, is when Islam comes into power. So Islam rises at a time when God's people are being persecuted by Western Rome, and they begin judgments against the Eastern Roman Empire. So these judgments are against the final third part of Rome. And so we're going to see that even though Islam does do uh, battle against the Western Roman Empire, the papacy, 
They don't do that during the whole time. The woes are mostly focused upon what's happening in the Eastern Roman Empire, which is something I didn't know as I went through and studied this. Now, Islam, of course, rose in uh, 629. Yeah. But often, when we look at the, the start, there's different starting dates that people would have for the fifth trumpet. Some would go to 612, some would go to 622. Uh, 629 is um, often the time that's given uh, because that's when Muhammad uh, s succeeds in unifying all of the nomadic tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. So he unites these tribes and they are now organized to do the work that they're going to do. And uh, now the other thing that happens is three years later Muhammad dies. And what happens is begins is what is called the Caliphate. And these are the successors of Muhammad. And Abu Bakr is the first of the of the caliphates. I'm not sure what you would call a person. He's a king, right, of the, cali of the caliphate. And now I'm going to read the command of Abu Bakr here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yes, and on the chart it, it says the rise of Muhammad, Muhammadism, right? Yeah, so here, yeah, 606, yeah. So the starting date of the trumpet is not really an important point. You know, you could choose different times in which you're going to start it. Uh, I believe Uriah Smith starts it in 629. Yeah. Uh, but in Abu, when Abu Bakr comes, uh, we have an interesting point. Uh, now we noted that they were not going to hurt uh, the trees and the earth and these types of things and that this power is to continue five months. Now one of the things that I discovered which I don't know if it's correct or not but it appears to be correct is that there's actually two periods of 150 years. It's the second period that's called the first woe. But if we looked, when we looked through those verses and read them we saw that it starts with the command of Abu Bakr and it talks about five months and then later on it talks about Othman and it talks about five months there. And I'm going to show you this on a chart, but first I just want to read, uh, or actually before I get to Abu Bakr's command, I want to just show you this map of the five months. And uh, this is the area that the desert locusts cover. When you look at the top one, and the purple one is the area that Islam conquered. And they basically conquered the exact same territory as the desert locusts. And the period of five months, so I'm just going to read this here from Albert Barnes commentary. It says, so far as the words here are concerned, this might be taken literally denoting five months or 150 days, or as a prophetic reckoning where a day stands for a year. The latter is undoubtedly the correct interpretation here. Amen. For it is the character of the book thus to reckon time. If this be the true method of reckoning here, then it will be necessary to find some events which will embrace about the period of 150 years, during which this distress and sorrow would continue. The proper laws of interpretation demand that one or the other of these periods should be found, either that of five months literally or that of 150 years. So we can, as he agrees, it's 150 years. Okay, so, actually, even before I get to the command of Abu Bakr, I'm going to go through this. Which Okay, this is the beginning of the fifth trumpet, so I should have shown you this. And we can see there's Muhammad, uh, the imagery that's used, the star, the smoke, the locusts, and they come upon the earth. And there's Abu Bakr, which is in Revelation 9, verse 4. Now, what I've done is I've taken five months from Abu Bakr's command until 782, the Treaty of Constantinople. And during this time, they were actually fighting mostly against Constantinople. That's what they were trying to conquer. In 782, at the Treaty of Constantinople, they were restrained. And I'm going to deal with this more in the third lecture, dealing with the loosing and the restraining. 
Um, now, a lot of these things, I'm not saying, you know, this is, I'm not adamant about these things. But as I studied these histories, these were things that just sort of popped out for me. Um, but we wouldn't call this the first woe. This is still the fifth trumpet. And then we see uh, there's a period here which is 517 years. And this, uh, in this period, they are not fighting against uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. They're actually fighting against the Western Roman Empire. And it's not mentioned in Revelation 9, but the period of the Crusades specifically from 1095 to 1291 is uh, when they were fighting over Jerusalem. So it's, it's an interesting part of this history. And it's after that time period that Othman rises to power. So we're going to go through that as well. And this is the first woe, the 150 years that's mentioned the second time in Revelation 9.10. Right, that's the first woe. And it ends with the beginning of the sixth trumpet. So I'm going to deal with that as well, more in the second lecture, uh, but a little bit in this lecture. Um, so. So uh, for some reason, I thought I had Abu Bekr's command here earlier. So I don't know where it went. Right. Okay. So where was it? It was before your math. As soon as. Oh, I I missed it. Is <laughs> what happened, eh? As soon as So it was back here, and I missed it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Because I wanted to read that, and then this other stuff showed up. It's in my notes. Yeah, but it, I just missed the slide. I was looking at it and didn't recognize what I was looking at. Okay, as soon as their numbers were complete, Abu Bakr ascended the hill, reviewed the men, the horses, the arms, and poured forth a fervent prayer for the success of their undertaking. Remember, said the successor of the prophet, that you are always in the presence of God on the verge of death, in the assurance of judgment, and the hope of paradise. Avoid injustice and oppression, consult with your brethren, and study to preserve the love and confidence of your troops. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women or children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any field of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make a covenant, stand to it and be as good as your word. As you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their, their monasteries. So these would be sa the Sabbath keepers, the ones who had the seal of God on their foreheads. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan. These are the ones who have not the seal of God on their foreheads, right, which is my words, who have shaven crowns. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. So that's from Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So, so we can see that. Sorry, I missed that earlier. I have to go back to this again. Okay. And you know, I'm always this mathematical guy. So I look at these periods of time and I don't just, you know, bat pass them by. That 517 years there, I, I noticed that if I divided it by 391 years going back from 1299, that the period of time between the first 150 years and the second, you can see that there, it's 126 years, which some of you understand the significance of that. Um, and I looked at the date AD 538. And so there's some significance, and I'm not going to get into it here at this point. But, uh, you know, I believe in God's providence that these events and these timing of these, these events are not arbitrary. And, you know, whether there's a major significance there or not, but to add 126 to 391, because we're going to look at the 391 year prophecy, to see that it adds up to the period between the 250 years. To me, it was just significant and said that, you know, it wasn't an arbitrary marking the 150 years. And I have found, found other people who have 250 year periods. And the first one, some put it, you know, 312 to 3 or to 762, right? And they have other reasons. So it's not important, but 
the main thing to understand is this 150 years from Othman and the date that that begins. Now, so I want to look at uh, this date and this is in dispute and we're, we're going to actually look at the challenges that have been made within Adventism. So if you were going to talk to the average Adventist scholar who's gone to Andrews, do you think they're going to uphold the date of July 27th, 1299 for the beginning of Othman's ri the Ottoman Empire rising to power? No, they won't. Even though that is the date based on all the history that I looked into, all they can do is brought, bring question to it and say maybe it's, you know, two years later. That's all they can do. They can't prove it's two years later. They can just bring doubt upon it. And this is one of the things I notice about chronology and any of you who've had to deal with people challenging uh, 677 or 723 or 457 is what they do is they bring doubts but they don't bring proof. And they think that just the fact that they brought a doubt is enough. Right? But it's not. And I mean I think that's a very very solid date in history. You know from all the research that I did it's a solid date. Um, so and that's when Othman rises into power and I'm just going to read what I wrote here. Uh, between the end of the first period of five months, I put there was 517 years, according to Wikipedia, Othman announced the independence of his own small principality from the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum on July 27th, 1299. So this is what Wikipedia says, right? So, you know, people who try to bring doubts, you know, doesn't mean you go to Wikipedia, you're going to get the right date for everything. Because in the chronology of the kings, they use Edwin Thiel's dates as the standard dates which are wrong um, but sometimes they're right and for somebody to say well it's not July 27, 1299 when Wikipedia says it is they have the burden of the proof there is on their side right they have to prove it. Uh, it was claimed the Khan of the Kayahan tribe and the, uh, and the Ottoman principality was just one of many small Turkish principalities and Anatolia uh, at the time that emerged after the dissolution of the Seljuks, all of which the Ottomans would eventually conquer to re reunite Alat Anatolia under Turkish rule. So they were going to eventually conquer these people and create the Ottoman Empire. And it's named after Othman. So it's marked July 27, 1299. Ottoman Empire rises, but it's not a full-blown empire. It's the rise of that empire that's important. And we're going to look at that later on, I think it's in my third lecture, where I deal with this loosing and restraining and why these events are marked the way they are. Because one of the things about the date, August 11th, 1840, and of course September 11th, 2001, is we need to understand the nature of this loosing and restraining. And I'm not sure I fully understand all the implications of it, but often when people criticize these dates or the events, they don't understand what those events are marking and why they're marked because when we look at them in history and why I like the first 150 year period is it's a period that shows us clearly the loosing and restraining. Abu Bakr looses uh, Islam to now go to battle. Muhammad organized them but Abu Bakr now brings them to battle and they're restrained at the Treaty of Constantinople. So we're going to look at that in more detail. It doesn't hurt if I repeat myself every once in a while. Um, so this second period of 150 years that commences is on July 27, 1299 is what is commonly referred to as the first woe. It begins in 1299. It must therefore end in 1449. So often, and I've seen this with uh, Steve Wahlberg, when he does the trumpets, he says it. there is an event on July 27, 1449, and he counts the th the 391 years and 15 days from that date. That's Steve Wahlberg. He's just one of the guys, some of you know who he is because he writes against the 2520. But the point is he's wrong. And we have to be careful that we don't use wrong arguments to support the truth. 
because they can be attacked. And that's not what the Millerites did. They did not say some event happened in 1449 on July 27th. They added the 150 years beginning on July 27th and counted to August 11th, 1840. Okay? So they actually counted a longer period of 150 years and 391 years and 15 days together to get that date. And so, you know, it's you find all kinds of confusing arguments used in Adventism. So we need to understand these, these things, dealing with the restraint and the loosening. Now, the second woe began where the first woe ended, right? So we talked about that. And this was a partial restraint. So the first, uh, the first woe, right, they were under a partial restraint. They could not hurt. They could only hurt. They could not kill. Right? But in 1449, that event uh, that happened there is important. And I'm just, I'm going to again just read some of my notes. Um, the second world began where the first world ended. The par this partial restraint of Islam was removed when Constantine XI, the last Christian emperor, voluntarily refused to accept his throne without the permission of the Turkish power and thereby loosed the four angels, the four leading Turkish sultans, and these were situated at Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad, who then invaded and conquered Constantinople in 1453. It is this yielding of Constantine um, the, the 11th to the sultan that marks the beginning of this period and thus the end of the first woe, and not the capture of the capital of the Eastern Empire, as our minds would naturally assume. Again, it is the actions that lead to the loosening or restraint of Islam's destructive power that are important to note, and not to the destructive acts themselves. So as human beings, we say, oh, there's a battle, the destruction of Constantinople in 1453, that must mark one of these periods. But it's the loosening and restraining power that's marking these periods. Does that make sense? Right? So it's not the destructive acts, acts themselves. Um, so when we look through the rest of Revelation chapter 9, dealing with this second, uh, the, the, the second woe, um, we're going to see this loosening and restraining and how it's, how it's related to the end of the second woe. So at the, um, in Revelation 9.12 it says, uh, the angel declares to John, one woe is past, and behold there come two woes more hereafter. It is the beginning of the end of the second woe over which there is so much needless controversy. So uh, the beginning and the ending of the second woe. So this is the one that we're going to be dealing with uh, in more detail here. Now, I'm just going to see. Yeah, so that's going to be my next thing that I'm going to read. Okay, so before I go back there, I'm just going to flip that back. I don't want you to read that while I'm reading here. So Revelation 19, 14, and 15 declares, Loose the four angels which are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, to for, for to slay the third part of men. So these four angels, as we mentioned, uh, that were loosed, was when Constantine XI voluntarily yields to the power of the Turkish sultans, right? And this period under which these four angels are to complete their work in the slaying of the third part of men is reckoned, uh, reckoned as 391 years and 15 days. And of course, we know then they're prepared for an hour a day, a month, and a year. An hour is how long in prophetic time? 15 days. Right. Okay, it's 15 days. Why is it 15 days? A day, a day into 24 periods, right? And one twenty fourth of what's that? Yes, there you go. So you take a day and one twenty fourth of three hundred. So that's how you get. So you take one twenty fourth of a year, which is fifteen days. Okay. So now a day, of course, is a year. A month is thirty years, and a year is three hundred and sixty. So you add three sixty, thirty one, and fifteen days. So it's three hundred. 91 
years and 15 days, right? So it's a very simple calculation. Now one of the things about it is it, that expression could also be used to point to a period in time. You know, we could say that something happened at such and such a time, on such and such a day, on such and such a month, and such and such a year. Now so some people try to say, well it's not a period of time, it's talking about a point in time. But it's both. Because it is one of the most specific prophecies as regard to a time just in and of itself because it points to a very specific day, August 11th, 1840, as we're going to see. Okay? Where the 2300 days does, but it does it in, in a less direct way through understanding the types. But this prophecy is pointing to a very specific time and it is the prophecy that confirmed the year-day principle Amen. and gave power to the Advent message, the Adventist message, Miller's message. So, uh, to try to dismiss it and say it's just some date, uh, it does injustice to the, all of Scripture, for one, but it, there's no way you could know what, when that date is. It would be God telling us something we couldn't know. So, it's also a duration or a period of time. Okay. And uh, the number of the horsemen that are to do this work are given as 200 million. Now, so the number of the horsemen could refer to all of the Islamic hordes uh, during this whole period. And it seems like an awful lot. You know, my wife and I both have a horse. They eat a lot, mm. you know, and they can do a lot of damage in and of themselves, uh, trampling over the ground. One, one person in history actually recorded watching uh, an army of about 300,000 Islamic horsemen for a large number of time. I can't remember how many hours it was that he watched them go, you know, past him. Uh, and he had to estimate the number. And I think he estimated like 250,000. But, you know, it could have been up to 300,000. Um, Islam was extremely powerful. The horses are expensive and these these Arab tribes that combined to go to these battles they were extremely destructive because they one is they had to feed their horses they had to feed their men and they needed to get a lot for all the effort they were putting into their work what's that locusts yes and so that's what you see that's why that symbol of a locust so suits Islam among other reasons so I mean it's pretty amazing when we think about it in history, to imagine that many horses, I have a hard time. But it is a fact that Islam uh, was very uh, a fertile place for both horses and soldiers, right? So there was lots of men who could, uh, and horsemen, right, who could go to battle and do this destruction. Um, so when we look at the, and we're going to read these verses here uh, in a moment here in Revelation 9, verse 16 to 21. Uh, let's read them right now. It says, The number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them, and I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire of jacinth and brimstone. Now, there's lots here, but when we look at, and I'm going to have some pictures in my third lecture, of the horsemen, uh, but when we when the first woe happened, uh, they had not yet developed gunpowder uh, to any degree, and especially to fire it from a horses. So when you look at the horses here, you know here he has a spear, here he has a gun, and the Muslim the Islam the Muslims were the ones who developed uh, the use of riding horses and firing guns, and. Uh, so we can see that this, this symbol is used here. Now, of course, when we look at, and we're going to deal with this in the third lecture, but in a, a triple application of prophecy, the characteristics of the first woe and the second woe are combined in the third woe. And we'll, we will see that, how that happens. So they had uh, uh, brimstone. Right? And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. But these three, by these three, was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. 
for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. Right? So that's the command, right? The, the words they speak, and in their tails, which is in their teachings, right? Which is the teachings of war, and their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So um, it didn't cause, even though there was these judgments, it didn't cause a conversion process. Now, where I want to go next in this uh, study is um, a little more uh, complicated. What's the time? I don't have my... It's uh, about 18 after 12. Okay, so, so I'm definitely using more time in this lecture than my last one. But uh, we have here a statement by Heidi Hike. So I mentioned him in the first lecture. And he is, uh, he wrote a book called Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy, which deals with Josiah Litch's prophecy, and he calls it a satanic prophecy. Satan's counterfeit prophecy, right? And so he rejects this prophecy as having any validity whatsoever. And he, I don't know how he does it, but somehow he takes his Ellen White's plain statement that this is a fulfillment of prophecy that gave impetus to the Millerite movement in, in confirming the year-day principle. He just says it was all false. And yet he pretends to uphold the spirit of prophecy. You know, it's, it's amazing sleight of hand that these uh, theologians, right, theologians, use, and um, it's revisionism, uh, but the thing that puzzles me the most is why so many people accept it within Adventism. Now, you know, obviously we know why, but you know, it's a sort of a, a puzzle that, you know, I always puzzle over things that I probably shouldn't, but Let's read this statement from, uh, now this is his response to Dr. Alberto uh, Treye. I believe that's how you say his name, at least that's how, T-R-E-I-Y-E-R, Treye. Treye? I don't know. I'm not sure how you would pronounce that name. That's how I would pronounce it in Canada. But anyway, it says, uh, the prophetic 391 plus 15 day years claimed for the sixth trumpet had to commence on July 27th, 1449 as well. Right? So he's making an argument against Josiah Litch's prophecy. In order to precisely fulfill the total span allotted to the prophecy of 541 years and 15 days. That is because William Miller, Josiah Litch, and the Millerites combined the two claimed prophetic time periods together as one continuous whole. Right? So he even admits that they combined it together as one continuous whole. What does he mean by 541? That's combining 150 years okay. with 391. And the Millerites did do that. This then demanded that the prophecy be terminated not only on the year of 1840, but also on the very day of August 11th, as Ellen White recounted of the Millerites' beliefs and teachings at that time. So he's just saying, she's just recounting their teachings. Now he says this, Unfortunately, Josiah Litch overlooked one very important point in his calculation of the prophetic periods, as you well know. The Gregorian calendar by Pope Gregory XIII Replace the Julian calendar by a papal bull signed into effect February 24th, 1582. When introduced, it immediately omitted 10 days in order to realign the calendar with the spring equinox, which was tied by the Roman Catholic Church to the celebration of Easter. The Millerites failed to take this 10-day discrepancy into account when they fixed the date for the termination of the sixth trumpet on August 11th, 1840. And I'm going to look at that in detail, but right now I'm just going to read the rest of his statement. Many Seventh-day Adventists today do not remember or know that their history has been falsely colored with numerous apologies and adjustments until Josiah Litch's prophecy has become almost unrecognizable to the historian. It's almost as if we Adventists have picked and chosen what we want to keep and have disposed of what we don't. This is exactly what Trey Ye... What's that? He's certainly true about that. Yes, he is correct about that. Well, and this is what Adventists have been doing, not just with 
uh, the trumpets, but with the 2300 days, with the 70 weeks, with all things. So then we're going to just say, well, since we have been trying to modify our teachings to satisfy the Protestants, that we should just throw the teachings out together, just throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we have to do is we have to go back and examine the foundation, use the same principles of interpretation that Miller used, so that we can establish, the, the get the same results, right? We can establish that those results are based upon sound principles. And so that's why you get some of the crazy things that I've read on the internet trying to support the pioneer view of the trumpets. Um, so it's just, you know, again, one of those things that boggles my mind. But it happens. Anyway, many Seventh-day Adventists today do not remember, right, or no, right, I read that. It's almost as if we Adventists have pick and, picked and chosen. So this is exactly what Treye blatantly does today. And it is all presented as fully supportive of the historic position. And I agree with him. If you read Treye's defense of the Millerite position, He's got all kinds of error, you know. Now, hope he doesn't watch this video because I have been <laughs> corresponding with him, and I'm trying to get him to study these things. Some of these points I brought out, but uh, he's brought in error, which comes from the Protestant principles of prophetic interpretation, to try to fix things so that w the scholars will accept it. But there is nothing wrong with the prophecy. The seven trumpets is sound as Uriah Smith presented it and as the pioneers Amen. understood it. Amen. Okay. So, uh, just looking again, I've, I've put the fifth and sixth trumpets together here, the first and second woe periods. Uh, Othman, the Ottoman Empire rises in 1449. Constantine voluntarily yields to the four sultans and Turkish rule begins, which marks the beginning of a period of 391 years and 15 days. And that ends on August 11th, 1840, when the, the, the Sultan of, of the Ottoman Empire yields to four Christian powers. And that ends Turkish rule and the Ottoman Empire falls. Now, of course, this is really a, a restraint of Islam. One of the criticisms criticisms is that the Ottoman Empire doesn't fall until the 1920s, you know. Yeah, but they were called the sick man of the east. Yeah, the sick man of the east, yes. Yeah. So if you ever want to, you know, do some medical work you there. Were sick because of this event. Yeah, you can look up the sick man of the east and try to help him out. But uh, the point is here that what happened is, the re and we're going to deal with this in the third lecture in more detail, these restraints and these loosings and how that's what is being talked about, not the, when, when did the last, you know, Ottoman king live, right? It's what, what power they have, what is loose, what is restrained. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of skip ahead here. Now, this is a chart. So one of the criticisms was the Gregorian calendar was used by Josiah Litch and he should have used the Julian calendar. Now this is the year 1299 and this is the new moon, first quarter, full moon, last quarter, when they occur. Is that, is that in your notes? No, nope, it's not in my notes. <coughs> uh, I put it up in my PowerPoint but not in my notes. And you can see that the month, the first month of Nissan begins on April 2nd because March 3rd is too early. Well, actually, that's the conjunction. It would have been on April 4th would have been the first day of the first month in 1299. Now, this is the Julian calendar. This is the Gregorian calendar. So these dates here on the NASA website are for the Gregorian calendar after 1532 or whatever the date is uh, when they change them. So they follow that change. And you can see in 1840 that it's also the conjunction also occurs on April 2nd. And without, you know, explaining all the detail, but you would have seen the first new moon on the evening of the 3rd. And so that would have made, uh, again, April 4th would be the first day of the first month on the Jewish calendar. So Josiah Litch did not know this at that time. It was later that they discovered the Karite calendar. And... You mean he didn't know when he made the prediction? When he made the prediction, yeah. So later on, he did understand the Karite calendar. 
but at this time he did at the time they made the prediction he didn't so unwittingly God in his providence made it so that the Karite calendar lines up with the Gregorian calendar in 1840 so that Josiah Litch would get the correct date. If he had modified and tried to take into account the Julian calendar he would have come up with the wrong date. Now I'm going to show this to you uh, a little more clearly. So what I have here on the top part again is July 1299 and you can see at the top is the Jewish months Tammuz and Av and July 27th in 1299 on the Julian calendar was Tammuz 26th and if you go on to the Gregorian calendar in 1844 July 27th was also Tammuz 20, 26, 1840 right so this is in July 27th 1840 and you can see Tammuz 26. So that means when you count 15 days, Av 12th would be August 11th. So he has the correct date according to the Jewish calendar. Irrespective of the 10 days. Irrespect, yeah, and actually it wouldn't be 10 days at that time because every uh, I mean, 100 years you get an extra day. Right. Well, it's a moot argument, right? But the thing is, uh, and I just did this because I've been studying so much of the Karite calendar, and I just thought, what if, you know? Now, the, the odds of that happening are 1 in 30, but of course, the significance of it for us is pretty significant, right? So, you know, to me, this is just something, it, it nullifies that argument that I've heard so many times by people attacking uh, Josiah Litch's prophecy. And some of the defenses that generally were done while God just, you know, they had the Gregorian calendar so God knew that. And, and of course he did, but we can also show that God in his providence provided for that objection in a really solid way. Where did you get the information um, on specifically in those years on the days of the Karaite calendar? For you, can only identify, you can only identify the beginning of the month of the barley. Okay, now what you're saying is partially true, but you can tell that when you have something so late, like, like if you, you, there's no way March can be the beginning. This is where I said it no, March, March 5th or whatever can oh, be no, the no, beginning, yeah. right? So you know that there's no possible way. And this isn't one where we're extending it later. This would be just the norm. So here we're, we know it has to be the right one. Because so you. It's still through calculations, but it's a calculation where there's some years, you know, you're kind of like, I'm not sure which way this is going to go. You can't calculate it forward, but, but you're, what you're doing is saying that you can calculate backwards and say, if it's March 1st, there's no way that could begin, begin the year because March 1st is yeah. too early. Yeah, I think it's March 5th or whatever. March 5th or whatever. Right, that's way too early. You would never have the first day of the first month in March 5th because you would never have bar ripe barley. So, yeah, we can know. Some years, you know, it might be, you might have a hard time deciding which, but with these ones it's not a problem. So we know that that would have to be uh, the correct date. And uh, yeah, even, even on the standard Jewish calendar these would be, you don't really need the Karaite calendar to I do this. I was hoping you would say, oh I have a graph of the <laughs> barley being ripe for the last 200, <laughs> 2,000 years or something like that. And yeah. Like, yes. Theodore, yeah. why don't you have it taken to the 12th, 13th? Why isn't it at the 11th? This is the 11th on the Gregorian. This is the, the month Av, right? They just, they happen to be one day off that year, the, the numbers. But yeah, so yeah, you can see it, it's August 11th, 1840, no matter how you slice it. So, and you know, and that's, uh, it, it, it's fun when you, when you discover these things, you know. And that's the thing that you can benefit when you dig on your own. You know, why do you have to let me find all these precious little jewels, right? You can find them too. That's what I want you to do. You know, so I don't have to do all that digging. Yes? Yeah, and I came across this argument about the 10 days. Yeah. Quite a few years ago. And, and I forget where I read it. Where mm -hmm. just taking a Bible, it, in 
verse 15 where it says that uh, we have to prepare for hour, a day, and a month, and a year in that order, right? Yeah. So if you take it in that order and add that to the uh, July 27th. Well, there's another good, okay. It doesn't affect, it does not affect the 10 days. But if you reverse the order, go out a year and a month and a day and an hour, then you have to take into consideration. That well, that's an, I've never heard that argument. That's a good one. Yeah, well, and so what, what he did, just for the record here, is he said when he looked at it, he took the hour first. So he added the 15 days at the beginning, right. not at the end, and then counted 391 years, which is, yeah. So, so, that, so that's another way of looking at it. But the point is, no matter how we look at it, and that's, that's another good argument that you could definitely bring. But God in his providence allowing that date to be correct on the Karaite calendar to me is significant. And uh, you know, we need to uh, be looking for these things. We will find these things. Now I just want to read this statement from the General Conference Bulletin. Uh, this is uh, April 6th, 1903. The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we have been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. I was in this message and ever since I have been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us. We do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed, as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer, seeking for light. Do you think that I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be as the rock of ages. It has been guiding me ever since it was given. Brethren and sisters, God lives and reigns and works today. His hand is on the wheel, and in His providence He is turning the wheel in accordance with His own will. Let not men fasten themselves to documents, saying that what they will do and what they will not do. Let them fasten themselves to the Lord God of heaven. Then the light of heaven will shine into the soul temple, and we shall see the salvation of God. Amen. And, you know, this platform, of course, Yes, 1903, at the time, the foundation is definitely being attacked. Undermined. Right. Undermined, yeah. And Ellen White wasn't going to take her feet off the platform, and neither should we. In another quotation very similar to that, she includes the year 1840. Oh, really? Where is that? Do you know? Uh, we'll have to Google it. I mean, we'll search it. But it's there. Okay. She, she adds that date to her. Maybe I should uh, include that in, in my next lecture, uh, if we can find that. So Ellen White, uh, you know, definitely uh, understood that these truths that the Millerite, Millerites found were a solid platform, a solid foundation. And, and that's why, I mean, it's good to examine them. Nobody says that we should not examine the foundation or the platform. We should. But when we examine it correctly, we will find that it's solid. Many people just step off the platform and never take the time to examine. They just criticize. Or accept somebody else's criticism. Yep. Or accept, you know, Cottrell's criticism and Whoever. Prescott's and, and uh, Heidi Hikes and all those type of people. So anyway, let's uh, just close with prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, uh, we come before you again thanking you uh, for the precious light. We just ask, Lord, that each of us can commit ourselves to you in searching for every stray ray of light to gather them up for the time ahead of us where we will need to be encouraged that you have led us along this path. We ask, Lord, that we can be diligent students of your word and mostly, Lord, that we can share these precious truths with others who are also searching and digging and that we can encourage uh, one another, you know, especially as we see the day approaching. And we just ask, Lord, that your spirit can still be here, that you can forgive us for our sins. You know, as we coming towards the middle of the week, um, help us, Lord, to prepare for the Sabbath the precious Sabbath hours that will be coming uh, later on, you know, to prepare our hearts so that we are 
are ready to receive the blessings that you want to pour out. We thank you for each one here, and we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.